okay, or stamped the seal on it. And so the clerk stamped the seal on it. It was a rubber stamp, and it had four letters, S-E-A-L. Seal. <laughs> that was their seal. That's the United States District Court. Okay. So that's all it takes for a seal. And so a seal's not exactly a big deal as far as its form, what its form is. However, a seal is an important item. Um, a contract, a contract between two parties uh, is always a quid pro quo situation. In other words, you get something for something. You give up something, but you get something in return. That's what all contracts are. Those are called bilateral contracts because they work both directions. A, mono, uh, a uh, unilateral contract is not enforceable, okay? If somebody says to you, I'm going to give you $1,000 on Sunday, you don't have to do anything about it. I'm just going to give it to you. And you make plans on that $1,000, and when Sunday comes, he says, I changed my mind. You have no case, okay? Because you, you, there was nothing required of you. You didn't have to give up anything to get it. So a unilateral contract is simply not enforceable in any court. Okay? Now having said that, there's one exception to that rule. And that's if the, con if, if the promise is sealed. If the person says, I'll give you $1,000 next Sunday, puts it in writing and seals it, the seal is the consideration. And when that seal goes on it, it's real. And that is enforceable. So now they're trying to minimize the importance of the seal, and you'll see that uh, a writing that is signed is considered uh, as good as a writing that's sealed. Words to that effect, I don't remember the exact words that are in the statutes. But uh, the thing that I notice is that all of government, all the courts, they all have seals. So I don't believe what I read. <laughs> And it's a common law. You can't, they're not going to be able to change the common law. The seal is there to stay. Okay. Now, going beyond that, <clears throat> if you look in Black's Law Dictionary, uh, you look up what a court of record is, you'll see in Black's Law Dictionary, the fifth edition, that a court of record has the power to fine or imprison for contempt and that it keeps a record of the proceedings, okay? So that's what Black's fifth edition says. It leaves out the other two requirements. If you look in Black's Law Dictionary, fourth edition and earlier, you'll find all four requirements there. Interesting. Yeah, it, the fourth requirement is, is that it's proceeding according to the common law. That means no statutes, no codes, okay? A court of record, the highest court of the land is a court of record, okay? No statutes, no codes. So <clears throat> you're proceeding according to the common law. Anybody ever hear of uh, statute of limitations? Mm -hmm. Doesn't apply in a court of record. Mm -hmm. Why? There's no statutes in the common law. If a court of records proceeding according to the common law, then statutes don't mean anything. So they make their bed, they better sleep on it. Yep. Yes, sir. Is there such a thing as an Article Three court? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, but that, that's under the Constitution. We're outside the Constitution in the common law. We're, we're in an Article Zero court, <laughs> okay? <laughs> My own sovereign court. So uh, I guess the first thing is you have to establish that you are proceeding under common law as opposed to statutory law. Correct, correct. correct. Yeah. And I'll show you how to do that. It's real easy. It's, in fact, it's fun. When you, see, when you see how we do this, you're gonna love it. But we'll get to that. <clears throat> but anyway, Ultimately, you challenge them because by what can we say that one human being has anything over another human being? 
Well, the response, the inquisitional response would be, well, God sent me to tell you. Now, how can you argue against God? Okay, I mean, that's the ultimate argument, at least back then. Well, if you look at verse 22, it turns out that we're equal to God. That means if we're truly equal, now we're not equal in terms of creating life or creating universes and, you know, a lot of areas, but we are equal when it comes to knowing good and evil. That's the point. And so you just simply say back to the person, well, thank you very much for bringing the message from God. I will take it under advisement. <laughs> okay? And you consider it. And, and if I get a message from God, I'm going to respectfully consider it. But I still have free will, independence, and equality to make a decision as to whether it's truly good or evil, whatever the issue is. And I, I don't know, might decide the pink shoes are okay if I were the accused, you see? So that, that's the beauty of that. Now, this is backed up by 1 Timothy, where the, the full name is Paul's first epistle to Timothy. And Paul wrote a letter to, to Timothy explaining a few things. And one of the things that he explained was that he says right in there, the law is for the lawless, okay? It's not for the virtuous. The, there, there's three criteria that he names in there. You have to be uh, faith unfeigned. You have to be, basically you have to have a, a, a good intent. And the law is not written for the person with good intent. The law is written for the person who is the lawbreaker. Yeah. Now what we're talking about here is you see, when, when, when Eve ate the fruit of the garden along with Adam, that was, according to that story, that is when we achieved the knowledge of good and evil. And that's sometimes called the law of the heart. In other words, you know, you're born with this knowledge. Nobody has to teach it to you. You know certain things. And so, if you violate that law, then we have the written law to tell you what to do. Well, as it turned out, there were a lot of people, apparently, who ignored the law of the heart. And so, at some point in time, out came this thing called the Ten Commandments. And we told people what to do. You can't do this, you can't do that. Well, that law was not for the lawful person. That law, the Ten Commandments, was for the person who ignored his deal. And this reflects in our, our system of jurisprudence because you know, for example, to pick a very obvious example, you know that one of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not kill. Now you're driving down the street, you're doing 25 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone, and a little kid runs out from between some parked cars and you can't stop and you kill him. Did you violate the commandment? that says thou shalt not kill? No, in our, in our system of thought, our philosophy, you are not held responsible. Why? Because you did not have the intent. Okay? If you have not the intent, then there is no conviction. You are not persecuted for accidents. Now that's different from what goes on in Islam. And I read about a case where this guy an American, that might have had something to do with it, I don't know. But he parked in a parking lot, okay? And his car was the only car there. And he went into the building. While he was in the building, a hot rodder came around, happened to be a native, okay? And he went too fast to get around that curve. <laughs> and instead of navigating the curve, he went off into the parking lot hit the American's car, and I don't know if it killed him or not, but certainly it created major damage, okay? So it got into court, Islamic court. And the American was held responsible, and the judge explained it to him, that what had happened was that the American had made a choice. He could have parked somewhere else, 
But because he made the choice that he did, he was being held responsible for his choice. A little different way of looking at things. 